Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, new webinar, Seven Surprisingly Effective Ways to Increase Your Worship Attendance. Uh, I'm Steve James, uh, Director of Congregational Development for the Western North Carolina Conference, and am delighted to, uh, uh, to be able to share this time with you. Uh, let me give you a few uh, directions about uh, participating in a webinar. And um, uh, some of you have done this before, and some of you have not. First of all, uh, you'll, the way that you are able to participate most effectively is through the chat uh, feature down at the lower right-hand uh, section of your screen. Uh, you can just uh, place your cursor in the in the chat win uh, the, in the chat box and uh, type a message. And then press the send button, and it will go to everybody. You can uh, you can ask questions that way. Uh, we I monitor that as I'm going through the presentation, because we're going to have uh, well now over 30 participants in the webinar. It's really very difficult for anybody uh, to uh, for me to open up everybody's microphone and allow everyone to speak. Uh, we get too much noise on the line, and, and it makes it difficult for people to hear. If you're having any kind of technical difficulties, uh, such as uh, not being able to hear or not being able to see the screen, if you would just uh, type that in the chat room, we have somebody who's monitoring that and will help you solve any kind of technical difficulties you're having. We also have uh, ways that you can indicate your your uh, response bes besides the chat room. Up at the center of the of the uh, screen, you'll see a little. Uh, a little uh, icon of a person raising raising their hand, and uh, uh, that person raising their hand is you. So you can you can click the down arrow, and you can choose uh, raise your hand, agree, disagree. You can tell us you're stepping away. You can also give me feedback, tell me to speak louder or speak more softly, speed up, slow down. You can laugh, and you can even applaud that way. So uh, uh, please feel free to use that to give feedback. And where that will show up on the screen is in the participants list, and you will see uh, uh, your name listed, uh, or whatever name that you signed in as a, an, as a guest. Uh, some people use their church names, and uh, but I see most of you have used have used your own name. So without further ado, if you have any questions, just type them into the chat room, and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, we'll go ahead and and get started with this uh, uh, with this webinar. So. Uh, Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we're so grateful uh, for this beautiful day and for the privilege of being alive, for the gift that you gave us of being able to, uh, uh, to be a part of your church, to be leaders in your church. We are so grateful for the gift of Christ that offers us such incredible opportunities and privileges. Uh, we are so grateful, Lord, for the the passion uh, that Christ places in our hearts, a passion to share this good news with others. And we pray that you would kindle our spirits as we, as we uh, meet together here online, that, you, that that same Holy Spirit that was given to us at our baptism would speak in and through this, uh, this experience to each one of us, and that we would hear not just uh, words that I speak, but that you would speak and that you would uh, show us a way to connect with people in your church and outside the church in order to engage them in worship and most importantly to engage them as, as fully uh, equipped disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So be with each one of us, Lord, and guide us in our, in our uh, conversation today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Again, welcome anybody who just came in, um, and uh, please use the chat room if you want to ask questions or comment on anything. Uh, we're going to begin, and you'll see me kind of looking around because I have to manage some things, but I'll, I'll try my best to, uh, uh, to keep you uh, at the forefront of, of uh, my attention. So here we go. Uh, I, I began uh, to be engaged in the ministry back when I was 18 years old. I, w I was a um, uh, student at McMurray University in Abilene, Texas, our, one of our little Methodist schools. And, and one of the privileges I had was being a part of what they called Christian Outreach. It was a group of, of, of uh, students, and I got to be the director of it. Uh, I was, it was a group of students who had committed themselves to give, give uh, uh, leadership to young people around the New Mexico and Northwest Texas annual conferences. 
And so we would travel every weekend uh, to locations around, uh, not every weekend, but we would travel uh, several week weekends a semester to locations around New Mexico and Northwest Texas uh, to provide leadership for youth events in communities. We would gather together all of the Methodist uh, churches in the community, organize uh, a, a youth event that would uh, include people from outside the community. It was a combination of revival and uh, youth programming, training, equipping. Uh, it was uh, it was just an amazing, beautiful experience. Uh, during the summers, while I was in college, I did the same thing. I traveled all summer doing the same thing across New Mexico. And 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 one of the one of the great joys of that was that I got to go to uh, dozens of of United Methodist churches, some in the most out of the way places that you can possibly imagine. If you uh, uh, picture in your mind an, an old west town and a, and a little Methodist church uh, sitting on the main street, uh, that, is, that is what I, I got to experience, to be able to take a team of, of, of college students and go and, and, pr and present the gospel of Jesus Christ in that setting. And what I remember vividly about that experience was the, the sense of, of beauty and power and 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 uh, holiness that I saw in those in those little out of the way places, where where God had led some circuit rider, uh, uh, you know, sixty, seventy, a hundred years ago, uh, to to take off on a on horseback and go across the desert, and to establish a community of Christians right there in that little in that little community, and that that had had been a source of faith and and grace and love, forgiveness. Whole, uh, wholeness for people for for generations because of the faithfulness of of a person who is willing to put themselves out there uh, for the sake of the gospel, and that's what I I think about when I think about uh, the churches where you're serving. Uh, I think about wh whether they're in a, a, a prominent location in a in a city, or or they're out in a in a small rural community, or or, or I, I know many we have many churches that uh, appear to be out in the middle of nowhere, just in a in, in a, at a crossroads with uh, nothing but farm fields all around them. But wherever your church is located, it's there because someone at some point responded to God's call and put themselves out there to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in a, in a powerful way. They established that outpost of, of God's kingdom, and, and it's, a, it's a remarkable uh, it's a remarkable thing that that has happened, and it's a remarkable treasure that we that we have that we that we are allowed to be leaders in those in those in those legacy holy places where 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 uh, which are the which are the legacy of someone's uh, willingness to put themselves out there for the sake of the gospel. I count it a high privilege to be able to to be a part of of this system of churches where the gospel of Christ is is shared in in beautiful ways every. Every, everywhere in this Western North Carolina conference. Now, I'm very aware that your experience of the church is is somewhat tarnished uh, uh, because you are you are very aware of all of the weaknesses of the place where you serve. You you know you know the dust that's on the windowsills, and you know the places in the in the building where the caulk is peeling uh, off the windows, and, and and you know the 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 person who uh, uh, sits in the corner of the room, uh, the curmudgeon uh, who who crosses arms and and uh, scowls and is ready to pounce on any new idea? I'm I'm very aware that uh, that the representation of the gospel is is not all that it should be in in these places, but nonetheless, the God who created us and the God who sent Jesus to save us, the God who who uh, loved us so much that he he gave his only Son for us, uh, that same God. With all of the power that created the universe, and with all of the love that saved and redeemed uh, billions of people through these last 2,000 years, that same God whose spirit brought about Pentecost, that same God is present in that setting with you. And there is something beautiful about being able to carry out the mission of Christ, even in spite of the dust on the windowsills and the caulk that's peeling off the windows and the curmudgeons in the corners. Uh, it is worth the effort to to continue to spread the gospel in every community in our in our in our conference. We're going to begin this uh, this part of the seminar by 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 um, 
reading the scriptures, and I encourage you to read along with me. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 19. Of course, this is uh, Jesus uh, sharing uh, uh, sharing uh, uh, his common habit of going to the synagogue uh, to, a, a, uh, to his neck of the woods, to a place where he was well known, and to, and to announce that, uh, that he uh, was going to be fulfilling this, uh, this beautiful passage of scripture from Isaiah. So Jesus announces good news to the poor. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, friends, the, the greatest danger for most of us, as Michelangelo put it, is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. And I just want to challenge all of us as we think about this, this uh, uh, beautiful way that, that, that Christ came into uh, uh, his ordinary synagogue, it's, it's a tiny space smaller than any of the churches that you're in, that Christ chose this tiny little place uh, uh, alongside the Sea of, of Galilee, uh, a, a place that was dustier than any of, your, any of our uh, dusty windowsills, a, a place that didn't even have caulk in the windows because the windows had no glass in them, uh, a place that was filled with curmudgeons who were ready to run him out of town uh, if, if, uh, as, soon as, as soon as he finished speaking, that, uh, uh, that, that, that Jesus chose that place to proclaim uh, the, uh, the gospel and, its, and his mission. And it is uh, such a great opportunity we have in every place that we are to proclaim the same gospel and to capture the same mission and to invite people along with it. And when we reach for that mission that Christ gives us, and whenever we, whenever we offer ourselves fully and completely to that, then no matter where we're at, God can do amazing things, miraculous things in and through us and the people that we serve. Now I'm gonna. I, I want to just uh, uh, check in with you and make sure that everybody's still with me. And so we're gonna have a uh, we're gonna have a poll here. I'm gonna share a poll with you, and I'm gonna ask you if you would to um, uh, to just answer this poll. There's some questions here for you to answer. You can just click on one of these. And what I'm asking is, what is your average weekly worship attendance at the place where you serve? This will give me an idea of, of uh, the, the people that are out there. There are 50 now online, and this will give me a, a, an opportunity to kind of calibrate my comments. Still got some people answering. So just go ahead and click your answer. All right, it looks like everybody is pretty much done, so I'm going to go ahead and and close the poll and... Here you can see the results. So we have uh, 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 the majority of our of our uh, attendees today have worship attendance between 26 and 125. We have a, a few uh, from 126 to 250, and a few that are over uh, 500. So we welcome everybody, but I'm going to calibrate my remarks, uh, especially towards those middle-sized churches. Uh, but don't despair, those of you that are in large churches, uh, the things that I'm going to be talking about are very relevant uh, for you as well. Uh, now, I think I have to turn that off now in order for you to continue to see the screen. Can everybody still see the screen? I think I think you probably can now. Now I want to. I just want to be clear that uh, sometimes we we mistake the competition that we are um, uh, that that we are up against. Uh, it it may it may appear to you that the competition we face is uh, you know the packed out United Methodist Church down the street from us, uh, where every pew is full and uh, they have to turn people away. Uh, but that is really not our competition at all. It, it may seem like that, and there's no question that each of us who have been a pastor have at some point, uh, have at some point experienced a, um, oh, screen is still blocked. Okay, well, let me close the, close that. 
Thank you for letting me know. There you go. Uh, thank you for, for, feeding back, for giving me that feedback. So the competition is really not the packed out church down the street where we know some of our, our, our members have ended up. Uh, the the competition is really not uh, LifeChurch.tv or any of the other television preachers uh, that are out there that are that are broadcasting their their sermons and their worship services. Uh, there are now hundreds of those out there, and and it may appear that that is our competition because we're aware that they that they have a, a vibrant presence online and that people do indeed go to those sites and see people uh, teach and um, and 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 find some uh, some encouragement and and some increase in the in their discipleship because of it uh, you probably go there as pastors to uh, to see some really fine preaching and to be able to experience that uh, but that's really not our competition on the contrary uh, you know our competition is 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 actually uh, something else in North Carolina in 2011 uh, the average uh, 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 Sunday morning 80% of the population is not present in, in, in Christian worship. 80% uh, absent from Christian worship. Uh, the evangelical uh, uh, brands of, of Christianity, uh, the, the Baptist, Assembly of God, Pentecostals, and some others, uh, would, would have 14% of the population in their services. Uh, the mainline churches, which would include us and the Presbyterians and Lutherans, uh, and some others would uh, we 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 have about four percent of the population in worship, and the Catholic Church uh, 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 generally you know has just about two percent of the population. Now of course this varies from county to county. You know some of the counties have as much as thirty percent of the population in worship on a Sunday morning. Some have as few as as uh, sixteen percent of the population. Also, our, our percentage that, that participate in United Methodist uh, churches varies dramatically. We have a few areas in our own annual conference where uh, over 8% of the population is worshiping in one of our uh, uh, United Methodist churches. So, so we, we, have, uh, we have variations in this, but the reality is, is that, uh, that a, a great many people are, um, uh, a great many people are, are, are just not in worship at all. And, and so you see the competition that we sometimes perceive of the packed out church down the street or the or the online churches uh, is is really dividing up that uh, 19 20 percent of, of people who are actually participating and the rest of the folks well we just are not present uh, in their lives now if you were to think about uh, the people in this green in this uh, uh, green area of 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 uh, eighty percent of the population not not present in Christian worship on uh, on a given time uh, on the in the chat room uh, in the chat area would you just just uh, just share you know what do you think about them if if we were to ask these people uh, do you have a church home what do you think they would say what would they say if you asked these eighty percent of the people in North Carolina do you have a church home what do you think just type some things in the chat room they would say yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think we all we all kind of uh, agree that that in North Carolina there is a a population group that is not present in Christian worship and yet who have enough Christian memory to be able to say to themselves, yes, I I belong to a uh, a church home, and they can name that church home, and maybe even maybe even they uh, uh, they can name the pastor. Uh, I'm going to do an, another uh, poll here that I'm going to ask you to participate in. And in your church, what percentage of your membership is present in worship on a typical Sunday? So take your membership and think about the average worship attendance in your church. And what, what percentage do you see in worship on an average Sunday? All right. I think everybody's had a chance to to give their their uh, uh, their thoughts. So, we're averaging between thirty and forty, the average church between thirty and forty percent of the membership is in 
worship on a on a typical Sunday morning. So among these uh, among this absent eighty percent uh, is is between seventy percent and sixty percent of the membership of your of your congregation. So I hope you can still, uh, see the screen again. So our competition is is really not the church down the street. In some respects, our 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 uh, competition is about the attitudes and relationships that th that these absent eighty percent have with people who are within our own congregations. So the competition is not uh, the church down the street. The competition is you know sleeping in. Uh, the competition. I mean, think uh, think about this on Sunday mornings. Now, I I know that y'all are wonderful preachers. Those of you that are pastors out there, I know you're wonderful preachers. I go around and I and I hear I hear sermons preached in in different churches, and I've heard many of you preach, and and I've been impressed with the quality and composition of of the sermons that I hear preached. Uh, but I can tell you that even the very finest preachers, it is rare for somebody to wake up on Sunday morning and as they're opening their eyes, they're thinking, I wonder what uh, Steve James is going to say uh, this morning at worship. I just can't wait to go down there and hear him speak. Uh, it's, it would be rare for a person to wake up on Sunday morning and, 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 and especially among that 80% and say, you know, the choir is probably going to knock it out of the park this morning uh, when they sing. Or I, I, I hope that the, that the music's going to be, uh, you know, uh, from uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman or uh, uh, some, some, other, some other favorite artist's uh, 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 composition. So, so the people are, 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 are having a different kind of experience of life whenever they're waking up on Sunday morning than, than what a pastor has. When a pastor wakes up on Sunday morning, they're anxious about what they're going to do, what they're going to say, how many people will come. And, and so as, as pastors, uh, and, and speaking just to the pastors right now, uh, our, we've got to recognize how different our experience is of, of the decision to participate in worship than uh, the typical layperson, and especially among that 80%. So the competition is often just just getting folks' attention on on Sunday morning. Uh, the competition is chores. Uh, people have compressed lives these days. Uh, in this recession, we have folks that are that are that formerly had one job that now have two or three, and we have people who formerly had one job who have none. And and so the pressures of life have have uh, just bled all over every day of the week. And folks are are um, yeah, folks are already having um, uh, uh, you know they're they're having a hard time figuring out how to manage all of the responsibilities they have. Uh, the competition is shopping. Uh, Walmart is open 24 hours a day. Uh, the grocery stores are open at 6 a.m. on on Sunday mornings, and I can tell you uh, now that I'm I'm not in 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 church from 7:30 in the morning uh, till 12:30 or one in the afternoon that uh, that those those parking lots are packed. Uh, uh, Sunday morning is every bit as busy as Saturday morning is for 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 stores and businesses uh, that are open. That's why they're open. So, in with with all of that being said, I just want to encourage you, you know, not to to be discouraged and not to give up. So let's let's uh, let's read Second Corinthians four one through one through nine. So this is why we don't get discouraged, given that we received this ministry in the same way that we received God's mercy. Instead, we reject secrecy and shameful actions. We don't use deception. We don't tamper with God's word. Instead, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God by the public announcement of the truth. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are on the road to destruction. The God of this age has blinded the minds of those who don't have faith so that they could not see the light of the gospel that reveals Christ's glory. Christ is the image of God. We, we don't preach about ourselves. Instead, we preach about Jesus Christ as Lord, and we describe ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. God said that the light would shine out of the darkness, and he is the same one who shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. God said that light would shine out of the darkness. He is the same one who shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay pots, so that the awesome power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. 
We are experiencing all kinds of trouble, but we aren't crushed. We are confused, but we aren't depressed. We are harassed, but we are not abandoned. We are knocked down, but we are not knocked out. Friends, uh, building the church is a contact sport. And I, and I say that because uh, one, of the, one of the challenges we face in the church is because our, our main gathering is a one-to-many experience where we have a, a pastor or a, or a, a, a group of, of single leaders, one after another, who, who uh, are in front of a, a group of people that we are used to experiencing church as a one-to-many or a many-to-one kind of uh, experience. And so we calibrate uh, many of our conversations as if one-to-many was the only way that we can communicate with people. And as a matter of fact, we, we, we tend to devalue the one-on-one -on -one kinds of interactions which uh, are becoming increasingly important in human life because people don't have those kinds of one-on-one -on -one interactions uh, very much these days. Uh, if you think about people who are knowledge workers, they are, uh, as you are right now, sitting in front of a screen someplace, often by themselves, uh, interacting with people through email, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, and, uh, and other uh, mediated experiences of, of interaction. But, but we, we spend less time face-to-face -face with each other than probably any time in, in human history. And in the church, uh, because we, we begin to speak to people one to many, and we, and we constantly speak to people one to many, and we calibrate our conversations one to many, we often find ourselves uh, uh, using some of the least effective methods of connecting with people and encouraging their participation in, in discipleship and in the life of the church. And building the church is really about building discipleship. And building worship attendance is really about building discipleship. And if, if we want to think about the most effective tools that we have in our arsenal uh, to, to be able to uh, connect people with the gospel, with each other, and with Christ, uh, many of those tools that are underutilized in the church are not one-to-many tools, and they're not even necessarily technological tools. They are the relational tools that build and strengthen relationships between people. Now, I can tell you that, uh, that when somebody wakes up on a Sunday morning who doesn't have the pastoral responsibilities to show up and preach and lead the congregation, that when they wake up on Sunday morning, there are things that they think about. They think about relationships. And if you want to know the most uh, uh, important uh, uh, quality that will predict uh, participation in worship, it is the quality, the intensity, uh, of relationships between individual people within the congregation. That is the driving force of worship attendance. It's more important than what you say on Sunday morning as, as the preacher. It's more significant than what the choir sings or the style of worship that you have. The quality of relationships that people experience in, in the church, in and through the church, have a greater impact on, on their decision on Sunday morning to show up in worship than any other factor. And those relationships have several different characteristics that we're going to talk about. And, and these are the surprisingly effective ways of, of connecting with people, helping them deepen their discipleship, and encouraging their participation in worship. Building the church is a contact sport. So, you know, what is it that we can do? Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I, I'm painfully aware of is, is the attitudes that we carry about people who are less active than others in our church. They're members of our church. They're on our rolls. We have their contact information, their email addresses, and uh, and and we we know we know who they are. We know how to connect with them, and yet they only participate in worship occasionally. They're Christmas and Easter uh, uh, Christians, maybe twice a year. Uh, somebody at uh, at at the last uh, presentation I made of this said uh, they're they're Christmas, Easter, and homecoming uh, Christians. Now the things that we can that we can say about people who are uh, Christmas and Easter and homecoming participants is that they have a connection with the church. If you were to ask them, where is your church home, they would name your church as their church home. Uh, they have a, a sense of historic emotional connection. Now that emotional connection may not be directly to your church, it may be with a parent, a beloved parent, who they go back to visit on Christmas and Easter or live in town and so they go on Christmas and Easter out of loyalty to a mother or a father or a brother or a sister, a beloved relation 
who who they want to uh, uh, to to please by being present at Christmas and Easter, but that just reinforces the 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 reality that it is relationships that drive worship attendance and participation. And so there are ways that we can influence people who are Christmas and Easter uh, uh, worshipers to be more engaged by cultivating deeper and, and uh, more powerful relationships with them. So how do you go about doing that? Well, the first way is to begin to notice, uh, is to begin to notice people who, who are present less often than uh, every week. And, and one of the best ways we can do that is, is to, uh, to begin to take attendance on an individual basis. Now, some of you may think that this is, uh, is, is completely, uh, you know, Donna, I, I, I just saw your question. Are there stats out there that show that the relational factor is the primary factor in worship attendance? Yeah, and I'll be happy to, to share those with you whenever, um, uh, uh, but I'm, that's not going to be part of this presentation at, at this moment because I'm kind of screaming through this to finish in 90 minutes. So uh, uh, as, we, as we go through, uh, as we think about worship attendance, uh, it may seem completely impractical to uh, track the attendance of individual people. But it's really critically important for us to be able to identify the folks who are who are changing in their behaviors, and and worship attendance is clearly one of the discipleship behaviors that we want to encourage. It's it's one of the uh, most important places where people are exposed to the gospel. It's the place where scripture uh, is written on people's hearts. It's the place where the songs of the faith are are uh, are are written on people's hearts, where they they have a a, a prayer life that is encouraged because of the richness of prayers that takes place in worship, where they, where they learn the language of the gospel. So attendance and worship is an important part of discipleship. And if we know that people are participating less than weekly, it allows us to target those people for uh, a, a more, a more uh, intentional uh, uh, effort to build relationships with them that lead to discipleship. Uh, here's, a, here's an example. Uh, when I was in in um, at, at Central in Concord, the uh, uh, a prominent doctor in in the uh, community, uh, his his wife and children had been members of the church. Uh, he was a doctor. He worked a lot of Sundays, so he was a very irregular attender. He was really just a Christmas and Easter attender, and he had a, a nominal relationship with Christ and the church. Uh, when 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 I when I met him and noticed that he was only attending occasionally. Uh, I began to seek him out at the hospital whenever I would go down and make hospital visits. I, I began to just ask him questions uh, about his life, and I found out that he, he besides his, his, his physician duties, that he loved uh, model, uh, model Railroad. And, um, and, and so I asked him, could I come by and take a look at your, at your setup? And he had this, uh, you know, this remarkable setup in his house that, uh, that covered a four-by-eight board. It was, it, was, it was just fun. Uh, and because I connected with him in that way, uh, he began to come become more interested in participating in worship. He became more active, and eventually asked me if I would baptize him. He had never been baptized, so so there 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 is there is a remarkable um, uh, opportunity that we have whenever we notice that people are less active than uh, than weekly uh, to engage them intentionally in deeper relationships so that we can help them move towards a deeper discipleship. Now, clearly, pastors, this cannot be your primary responsibility. So you know, we, we need to build a, uh, a system that allows us to be able to capture uh, this information, to manage it. And even in a small church of 25 to, uh, to 75 people in worship, uh, one person can take a piece of paper. And as a matter of fact, I, I'll, I'll share this document with you. Uh, this can be put on a legal size paper. Up to about 150 in worship, you can do this on paper as easily as you can on a computer. If you have over 150 in worship, uh, software is, is a better solution, and there are dozens of, of software products out there that will allow you to do this. So, um, uh, so, so uh, if you track the attendance, notice attendance patterns, and, and, uh, incre and, and create a, an intentional plan for responding to people who attend less often than weekly, and to respond to people whose uh, participation changes, you can have a huge impact in uh, worship attendance without even having a, a new person walk in the door of the church. And by the way, if, you, if you're interested in how to get first-time guests into your church for the first time, how to increase the number of first-time guests 
uh, the best thing you can do is participate in our turnaround boot camp and I'll be providing a link to uh, the registration for that because we focus ex extensively on how you can increase your connection with the community and engage people in the church in uh, in practical uh, uh, faithful ways of connecting with uh, with folks who are far from God. So uh, uh, some churches are turning to a different way of, of collecting attendance data uh, in, in order to get people to uh, to give give us information that they're present, they're going to a connection card rather than the pew pads. And what this does is is uh, it it uh, it provides an opportunity for everybody in the church to give give specific feedback uh, to the congregation. Some of that feedback might be name, address, email for first time uh, or second time guests. But on the back of the card, you also have opportunities for everybody to respond either by taking notes. Uh, or by checking off uh, next steps that they would like to take and sharing those. Uh, so, so in um, in new churches and in and in churches that are 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 really uh, doing some thoughtful work about this, uh, these cards are are handed out to people separately from uh, the bulletin, so that folks are asked to turn to uh, fill them out at a particular time in the service. The uh, this card is split in two so that the top half where you can a person can take home the notes that they've taken with all of the connecting points for the church and the bottom half uh, is uh, intended to be uh, uh, filled out and dropped into the offering plate at the end of the service so folks at the end of the service have had a chance to respond now uh, this allows you to connect uh, collect information about who's present now some people ask uh, about this you know we don't get good uh, good data from 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 the uh, registration pads that we use now, uh, some folks just won't fill out the information. Well, well people, uh, just uh, don't be anxious about that. There are ways that we can increase the, the number of people who fill it out. One is to write a script that is uh, very thoughtfully prepared that allows, pe uh, that encourages people to, uh, to go ahead and share the information even though they might be regular attenders, members of the church. Uh, something like, uh, friends, uh, we are handing out these connection cards to you, and if you're a first-time guest, we, we are just so grateful that you're here. We know it's a huge thing that you've chosen to be with us, and, and we, we, we want to treat it as, as the huge thing that it is. And because, because we're so grateful, we, we'd love to be able to send you a thank you note or, or connect with you after the service because we know that, that uh, it can be very intimidating to come in and, and, and connect with people here in its very busy spot. And we'd love to be able to connect with you, answer your questions, and just encourage you. So if you're a first-time guest with us, would you please share with us some contact information on the connection card? And for those of you that are regular attenders or members of the church, uh, we do keep track of, of uh, attendance in the church because we, we want to love each other better. And one of, the, one of the things that we realize is that with the number of people that we have in worship, uh, I can't tell as the pastor uh, who's present and who's absent in a given week. So if someone's if someone's ill or if some change has happened in their life, if if, uh, if they're away from us, we want to be able to reach out to folks who are away from us. So if you fill out the attendance information there as a member or regular attender, we're just so grateful because so, we can use that to better love one another. And it's remarkable how many people will participate. But even if you don't get 100%, you do get some good information. And um, yeah, these samples will be uh, available on a link. Uh, so you, you, can, um, you can take these and adapt them. Uh, I'll provide that a little later in the, in the, in the seminar. So one of the, one of the ways that we, can, that we can increase worship attendance is to close the back door a bit. Uh, notice changing participation patterns and and create a plan on how to respond to people who are beginning to drift away. Uh, that eighty percent of people who who are, do not attend worship, many of those at some point were were baptized. Uh, many of those at some point made a commitment to Christ and the church. Uh, they said that they would support the church with prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Uh, they intended to do that. They had an experience of Christ that, that um, made them uh, courageous enough to step forward in a worship service in front of, of, of dozens or hundreds of people and to pledge their faith to Christ. That was an experience that made them think that they would, they would pour them, their whole selves out for Christ. But over time, that commitment, because of the, the weakness in our discipleship patterns, because they they didn't connect with somebody because they they didn't get the encouragement they needed or because of some crisis in their life that that uh, caused them 
to drift away. Those folks who at one time made a deep commitment to Christ are now inactive or less active than they could be. So if one of the one of the things that we can do as a church to increase our worship attendance is to have a plan in place to make sure that we close the back door and 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 don't let folks drift away because of neglect uh, or a discouragement or a crisis. So uh, when we're taking attendance and we notice that uh, we, we, we have a plan in place and we notice that someone who has been attending weekly misses three weeks in a row, we have a plan for how a lay person in the church would, would, would respond to that. And what would be those kinds of responses? Well, uh, you know, you don't call folks and say, hey, you know, I noticed you weren't there on Sunday because in reality you didn't. But a friend can call and just check in with somebody and listen to what's going on in their life. And they will very likely reveal uh, what's happening. Uh, and, and it is okay in that context to say, hey, I've missed you. I haven't seen you. And I was just calling to check in. So not to chastise folks for missing, but to just reach out to them in love and to, and to open the door. Uh, open the door back up for them to participate more fully. I can't tell you how many times when we've done exit interviews with people who've left our churches that the, the number one thing that they say to us is that I got sick, I had a crisis, I was away for six weeks and nobody noticed. I mean that is the number one things, thing that folks said and it is a deep, a deep, deep wound that people experience whenever we are not paying attention enough to be able to, to notice that they're gone. Now, if you think about why this is, uh, why this ch has changed in the church, it, 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 it's changed because the nature of, of neighborhoods and relationships have changed. It used to be that for most of our churches, people lived in close proximity to the congregation. When we establish a new church, uh, it tends to reach people within a one-mile radius, uh, radius of the church much more uh, uh, actively than people who live farther away. And so there is a connection that is multifaceted for people in the church. Uh, they tend to work close together. They tend to, uh, to have their children go to the same school. They are participants in the same civic organizations. They see each other many, many, in many different settings other than church. In this day and time, our congregations that are over 15 or 20 years old, uh, people have sometimes moved once, twice, or three times during that period, and in each each uh, move, they've moved farther from the church. They have become less connected to the community around the church building, and because because the 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 multifaceted nature of those relationships have diminished, uh, therefore the church has to do a better job of using the one facet that we have of participating in the church to uh, to leverage other opportunities to to connect with people uh, the the narrow gate uh, yeah I will you'll have you can have a copy of the outline and uh, in and a copy of the PowerPoint uh, 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 at the end of this uh, of this uh, webinar so the important thing is to have a plan on how to respond to people who are beginning to drift away and I can't get into the details of that because I will run out of time if I do but uh, uh, but we will we will begin to uh, to think about that. So I'm going to do an, another little poll here, just to keep you guys involved, since it's just me talking. If I can find the poll, there it is. So just share with us. Share with us, uh, you know, do you have a plan in place right now uh, to notice changing participation patterns and respond to people? Uh, uh, would you like to have a plan? Yeah, you can change your mind. It's good. All right, good. So we have some that have a plan. Excellent. I'm so happy to see that. You know, 25% uh, of the folks that are on, online with us uh, have a plan, it looks like. I'll broadcast the results. And uh, 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 so we've got about 25% of the people that are online with us today that have a plan already. 29% have a plan already. That's wonderful. 44% of you would like to start working on a plan. And uh, uh, the plan really has several steps to it. First of all, you have to take attendance in order to notice changing atten uh, participation patterns. Another changing participation pattern that you can note if you would ask your uh, receiving treasurer in your church 
uh, to let you know if if someone who who participates financially in the church on a regular basis, monthly, weekly, has a has a regular pattern of giving, and that pattern of giving uh, changes, that that uh, that they would notify you, not that you would call them and say, uh, "Hey, I noticed that your check didn't come." I mean, oh, by by no means would we want that to be the case, uh, but but. What, what, and we're not interested in, in, in uh, increasing their giving. That's not the point of this. The point is, is that uh, oftentimes people who are, who are drifting away from the church, one of the first signs of their drift is that they reorder their financial commitments and they, and they, uh, and they don't contribute to the church. And sometimes this can be a very profound sign. I can tell you that whenever I was in college, my, my parents went through a financial crisis. Well, it was a calamity. Uh, they just went through a financial calamity that was uh, that was uh, you know like what's going on with with uh, really lots of families right now, and because of that, uh, uh, they couldn't just they couldn't pay their their uh, pledge to the church anymore. Uh, they couldn't even pay their rent. So so uh, not being able to pay your rent uh, kind of implies that you can't pay pay your pledge very easily to the church. So they quit paying their pledge, and because they quit pay, pay, paying their pledge, they didn't feel like they could participate in the church anymore. And um, so while I was in college, my parents drifted away from the church. Uh, now the church, uh, let me tell you what their response was. Their response was at the end of the year, uh, in De first of December, they got a letter from the finance committee saying. Uh, you know, you need to pay your pledge. You know, we're we're behind. Uh, you know, you still owe a thousand dollars on your pledge, and uh, you know, so uh, here's an envelope. Send it in. So that was the response they got from the church. So do you think that they would uh, feel drawn back to the church because of that? Uh, no, it would have been lovely if one of their friends had noticed that, uh, or the pastor had noticed that they had been drifting away, and instead of a letter from the finance committee saying, pay up your pledge, they had had a phone call from, uh, from, uh, from a friend that was in their small group or in their Bible study who said, hey, we missed you. We'd love to see you. Is everything okay? So that they would have the support and encouragement of someone who loves them. Um, yeah, so is this leading up to the weekly information we'll be required to uh, re provide. No, not really. This is really not about that, uh, Deborah. Um, yeah, so Jay asks, what about those who come to the church only once in a while? If their irregular attendance is a pattern, do we still need to have a follow-up? Absolutely. Yeah, the opportunity we have with folks who are, uh, well, that'll actually be the next, uh, the next slide. So, So think two to three and three to four. So if you think about the folks that are irregular attenders like Christmas and Easter people, think about uh, cultivating relationships with them uh, that uh, encourage them to participate more. So somebody who comes Christmas, Easter, and homecoming, uh, if you can find ways to connect with them, and I'm talking about lay and clergy people, a plan for for someone to intentionally reach out to them for the sake of, of Christ, the gospel, and their personal discipleship, and to cultivate a friendship with them that is deeper and, and more multifaceted to encourage them to participate so that they don't just have their mother that they want to please at Christmas and Easter, but they have their friend John who, uh, who they want to please, and so they, they, uh, uh, they, they are willing to be open to an invitation to John to come to the men's group on a Saturday morning or to uh, a, a special worship service or to help with a mission project. So, so if you can identify who the people are that are attending only a couple or three times a year and, and, and create a plan for uh, individual people to take responsibility for cultivating a friendship or relationship with them, and oftentimes all they're doing is not creating a new friendship. They're they're connecting with somebody that they already know, but they're connecting now with an intentionality that they are are, are trying to help that person uh, become a a more faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. So four to two, thinking four to two is identifying uh, uh, people who who attend only once a month. There are a lot of folks who attend only once a month. As a matter of fact. 25% uh, of the households in North Carolina have somebody in the house who works on Sunday morning. So if, you don't, if your only worship service is on Sunday morning, uh, then 25% uh, of the population uh, of the households in, in, in your neck of the woods is likely to have somebody who's working at a nurse at a, uh, as a nurse at a hospital, who's, who's a, a police officer, firefighter, working at a store, 
uh, that that's open on Sunday mornings, working in a restaurant, uh, working at one of the uh, gyms. There, there are so many things that are open that require people to be at work on Sunday morning. So there are a lot of folks who attend only once a month because that's the only Sunday that they're available. So you can you have several opportunities here to just identify who those people are and make sure that someone is responsible for connecting with them. Now, large churches organize themselves in small groups for this purpose, and they have small groups with uh, 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 with one or two, usually two leaders, uh, each of whom has a responsibility to uh, to notice the attendance and participation patterns of the people in their group. And this is why small groups are so valuable. In um, in building deeper discipleship in our in our congregations, uh, uh, they're 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 challenging to get started, but once they get started, people find them to be very valuable, and so that's one model one model for plan uh, for a plan to uh, to increase the the level of relationships. But it, the important thing is to establish particular leadership responsibilities, lay leadership responsibilities. Uh, for for uh, uh, cultivating these relationships, and can you uh, address everybody? Maybe not, but you can address some people. And it's remarkable how few people you have to address, and in and uh, 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 in this way, in, in order to increase your worship attendance uh, quite significantly. Uh, oftentimes, what we find is that people who are only attending twice a year have a very weak relationship with the church, and so uh, uh, sometimes it's small invitational events. That they need to come to to build relationships uh, that that will support their increased discipleship, and those are things like inviting somebody over for dinner, inviting them to go to a ball game with you, inviting them to participate in a hobby, leading up to invitations to uh, opportunities to increase their discipleship, either through participation in worship, a Bible study, prayer group, a missional engagement, or something like that. Uh, okay, so I th I think I've explained two to three and four to two, so. Um, and, and I just remind you again, discipleship is a contact sport. If you haven't gotten anything out of this, all of these systems are being put in place to increase the quality and uh, uh, intensity of personal relationships between people in the congregation. Individual people, one-to-one -one, uh, relationships, so that someone in your congregation has a sense of leadership responsibility for the discipleship of other people. And multiple uh, uh, leaders would have that kind of discipleship responsibility, which would include relational responsibility, not just teaching a Bible study or, or uh, uh, hosting a mission event, but rather that they know that there are certain people in the, in the congregation that they are praying for, encouraging, connecting with, uh, uh, listening to for the sake of the gospel to help them uh, 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 become more connected. So here are some of the places of leverage that we have in terms of human behavior. Uh, one, one of the realities is that, um, uh, that people, uh, human behavior is, is, uh, is sophisticated and strange, and it is, it is not always what it appears to be. Uh, marketers have become really quite adept at understanding human behavior and, and, the, and the levers that they have to be able to encourage people to do what they want them to do, buy something, uh, are, are really quite uh, powerful. Now, I'm not, in, I'm not encouraging us to become um, uh, mass marketers. Uh, this is really about uh, human behavior, but some of this is information that we've learned from marketing that allow us to understand how people, um, how people participate. Um, how do small groups fit in worship attendance? Small groups uh, develop the kinds of deeper relationships among people, and when those small groups are linked to the patterns of of uh, of, of uh, teaching and and prayer that are exemplified in worship, small groups reinforce worship attendance. So probably the most powerful small groups are ones where the where there is a system in place where uh, what happens in the small group is intimately connected with what happens in worship. Sometimes that's a video presentation that actually is uh, from a pastor, but oftentimes it is uh, thematic, so that the 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 pastor is in 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 preparing preaching is working on a a particular set of themes through the year, and the curricula that the that the small groups are using is directly related to what's happening in worship, so that there's a direct link to what happens in a small group to what happens to worship. But the most important part of the 
of the work in small groups is a, is around uh, a personal discipleship, individual behaviors that lead people closer to Christ, prayer, Bible study, uh, uh, service in in mission for Christ, and um, uh, and and learning how to how to how to share our faith. As as those small groups. Uh, uh, practice those behaviors, they are also at the same time exemplary uh, 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 instances of, of, of mutual love and uh, love that has a, 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 a discipleship component to it so that someone doesn't just uh, feel affection for someone but they also recognize we have responsibility for each other's dis discipleship. So the law of cookies is a, is a principle that uh, I learned a, a number of years ago uh, that um, that w one of the realities is that uh, that when people are asked to to change their behavior, and in each case where we're talking about moving somebody from outside the church into the church, from a a, a, a position of participating very occasionally, once or twice a year, to participating more frequently, from becoming a monthly attender, from being a monthly attender to becoming a, a more active attender, we're talking about changes in human behavior. And, and uh, uh, changing behavior, as, as you know, uh, is, is difficult. We're in that, this season of the year when folks are trying to do uh, exercise, uh, better dieting, and, and uh, we've come to recognize that it's, it's important to, to, to set the environment to, in such a way that we can actually accomplish those goals. So if, you, if you're going to exercise on a regular basis, there's nothing more powerful than having an accountability partner, somebody who exercises with you, who's waiting for you. If you're trying to control your, your eating, uh, it's, Im it's important to, to keep a record of what, you're, of what you're eating and what you're not eating and setting a goal for how much you would eat or how little you would eat. Uh, in order to accomplish that goal, and then even more powerful to have an accountability partner who who is uh, counting on you. Well, similarly, when we're asking for changes in behaviors for people to participate in activities in the church, there are some levers that we can uh, that we can use that increase the opportunity for them to actually respond. And one of those letter, uh, levers is the law of cookies or the law of responsibility. Uh, we are much more likely to participate in, in some activity that's new or different than what our normal pattern is if we have a specific responsibility related to that activity. So in other words, if, uh, if I am going to a neighbor's house and, uh, and, and I know that the neighbor has organized a party and the party has several different elements, so they have, uh, they have uh, somebody who's bringing drinks, and they have somebody who's bringing chips, and they have somebody who's bringing uh, meat, and they have somebody who's bringing some vegetables, and they have somebody who's bringing uh, uh, cookies, and I'm that somebody that if I don't show up, my responsibility will have been have been let down. But I but if I'm responsible for bringing the cookies, I'm therefore very very likely to show up. So one of the uh, one of the opportunities we have when we're trying to increase the participation of someone is to strategically choose who it is that we um, who it is that we um, uh, that we invite to take on particular responsibilities, and and uh, so so we we all we, we all know that idea of the 80-20 rule that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Well, this gives you an opportunity to to involve the 80%. Uh, in in specific responsibilities in order to uh, increase their participation and move them towards the 20 percent. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, on Sunday morning, if you want someone to show up for worship, if you want somebody to show up for worship, uh, what's probably the most effective way you can... Um, oh, good. I'm glad y'all are sharing with each other. Thank you. Yeah, so... Uh, so, so what's the uh, one of the most effective ways to get somebody present in worship who's usually not there is to invite their children to take on a particular responsibility in worship, to to read the scripture, uh, to be present as uh, acolyte, uh, uh, to assist the pastor in in some uh, in some uh, uh, liturgy on on Sunday morning. Uh, 
because they have a responsibility that engages their children in worship, they are much more likely to participate. If you have a children's choir, you all know that when the children sing in the children's choir, your attendance will increase by a significant percentage because parents, grandparents, and others come. But it also is the case that, uh, that the parents come because they have a responsibility to their child and to the church to get them present. So taking responsibility for something is the law of cookies. And so you can use this as a lever to uh, involve people who are less involved by asking them to do particular responsibilities. Now the problem with this is, is the problem with crowds. Uh, oftentimes the reason we have an 80-20 rule uh, in, in the church is because we use uh, one of the least effective methods of asking people to participate um, uh, uh, to participate in in, um, in in some new activity. And what I mean by this is um, this is really out of chapter eight in the book Switch uh, by uh, uh, Dan and Chip Heath, and uh, there'll be a link to that, and it's in, available in our resource center. But in chapter eight, uh, they they talk about the the way that we as human beings are trained, equipped, genetically programmed uh, to calibrate our activity and our response based on what we observe other people to be doing around us. And some of this is conscious, and some of it's unconscious. You know, if you look at this picture on the screen, you see that these people have all kind of calibrated their attire. They're dressed kind of alike with uh, like one another. You don't see anybody with a tie on. Uh, you, uh, you, I don't see any women with dresses. I think they're all in all in slacks. Uh, the, men are wearing t-shirts or, or pullovers. So they've calibrated their their attire. That happens in every in in every kind of group. We we calibrate our behavior to match the behavior of people around us, and this works very powerfully in terms of creating a a sense of connection, tribal identity. Uh, you know, you see it, you know, profoundly displayed in in uh, uh, in stadiums of people who are out to observe their favorite teams. They all wear the same colors. Um, uh, now, now, Steve, uh, if you would like to share uh, a document, if you can send it to me, I can put it also on the uh, on the on the uh, website that you'll get at the end of this. Uh, at the end of this webinar, so it'll be included with um, with all of that information. Um, so we calibrate our we calibrate ourselves to others, and this can work powerfully for the good, and can work powerfully for the bad. Uh, you remember in the '60s, it, uh, there was a woman named Genovese in New York who was brutally attacked outside of an apartment, and 28 people observed her attack. It went on for uh, uh, for for 20, 30 minutes. Uh, she was she was beaten. She couldn't get a, escape from the from the attacker. People observed her being attacked, and they and this is even more important. They observed each other observing her, and not one person responded. And because not one person responded, no one responded. I mean, it it, it they calibrated their behavior based on what they observed other people doing. And and it was not that they were all hard-hearted or or that they were that they were uh, some somehow more brutal uh, kinds of people. It was because they observed other people not responding. And and this has been tested sociologically on a number of occasions where people have been confronted with a person who is who is wounded or injured laying on a sidewalk, and and the the test has been that the 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 uh, 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 the researcher has had one person who was programmed uh, to walk right past the person who was injured without responding. And because one person walked past without responding, other people began to respond in just the same way. And it's very likely that if a person is injured, hurt, laying on a sidewalk, that if only one person doesn't respond, that many others will ignore that person as well. Because we calibrate our behavior by by looking at what other people are doing. Now, so so here is here is the um, here's the problem we have in the church is that when we ask people one to many to do something, especially when we're doing it in a worship service where they're where we're looking out at at dozens or hundreds of people, and we say we need twelve people to take on this responsibility, and uh, and 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 
we look out over the congregation and everybody is continuing to just sit there they've heard our request but there's no visible response then everybody in the room will calibrate their own response to that they will calibrate their response to the lack of visible response in the room now this is why Billy Graham when uh, he conducts c conducted revivals would ask people who had come to be counselors uh, to be the first ones up and to respond to the invitation to to follow Christ, so they would get up and move towards the front of the uh, of the of the stadium or the auditorium. And the reason that they did that because they found without that 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 it it took a long time to get the very first person to respond. But if one person gets up and begins to move, then others begin to join them and are willing to uh, uh, to calibrate their behavior with this new thing. So so when we're inviting people. That means that, that we have to become uh, much more strategic in the way we think about inviting people to participate in something new, to answer or respond to a call. We have to, we have to make sure that we give visible signals that other people are responding. So when you're, when you're saying to a congregation, we need 12 people to do this, uh, to make sure that you know that there are at least four people or three or one person in the congregation who's already responding and to just say in 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 the announcement we have we need 12 people to do this uh, we already have several people who who are who are going to do this so would those of you that have already said yes would you please stand where you're at okay so these folks have already responded we need eight more so who's going to be the next ones and and sure and and you will increase the likelihood that the other eight will come forward uh, dramatically by by uh, thinking strategically about calibrating a visible response for people to match uh, that's visible uh, and noticeable okay so um, now um, we can also use the power of lunch <coughs> to uh, engage people uh, the power of lunch is very simply the power of relationships. So, uh, what is the most powerful way that we uh, that what what is the way that we that we gather family together to uh, to build relationships in a family? We eat together. Uh, what is the way we gather with friends uh, in order to connect with them more deeply? We eat together. Uh, when we're when we're uh, dating somebody uh, before we get married, what is it that we uh, choose to do? We uh, we 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 go we go to eat some somewhere together. Uh, eating has a powerful and and Jesus of course used holy communion as as a a, a way of eating together uh, as a as a primary form of forming the community of faith. So uh, uh, one of the great opportunities we have to deepen the engagement of people in in uh, discipleship is very simply uh, arranging for people to eat together. Now, this is also really important right now uh, in the world because, um, because we have so much hunger, uh, physical hunger as well as spiritual hunger in, in uh, our part of North Carolina. Uh, uh, 20, uh, over 20 percent, perhaps as much as 25, many as 25 percent of the, of the uh, families with children under the age of five have someone who goes without food uh, once a month in their house. It's, it's usually not the children, uh, the parents feed their children but somebody misses a meal because they don't have enough resources to be able to uh, to feed their whole family at least once a month so that's 25 percent one out of four I was at Ginghamsburg in October and uh, one, one of the things that Michael Slaughter told me was he said we are not going to open any new worship services in any location unless we feed people too he said we just have that conviction there's so much hunger out there that people need to be fed physically fed and so they offer uh, at their um, uh, at their Fort McKinley campus and at Ginghamsburg, they offer a meal all day long, uh, or all all during the services. So there's there's food being served in some part of the church through every service. At uh, Fort McKinley, it's uh, it's a wonderful meal of it's a wonderful meal of uh, 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 of omelets and. Uh, uh, waffles blueberry and chocolate chip waffles uh, fresh fruit orange juice coffee it's uh, it's served down it looks like uh, like the service line of a 
of a of a five star restaurant. The people are lined up there, you know, come up and order your omelet. They cook it for you right there. It's a beautiful meal. They can serve it for about two dollars a piece, two dollars a person. Uh, it's not a free meal. They put a little a little box on the table, and every fifteen minutes or so, somebody stands up and says, "Hey, you know, this costs us about two dollars a person to provide this meal." So, uh, you know, if, if, if you can, just drop the money in the box and, and we'll collect that. If you don't have the money today, it's okay. Uh, you can pay another time, but, uh, but we're just delighted that you're here and, and uh, hope that you enjoy the, the meal and the worship. Um, yeah, so great. We've got people who are, who are using the Power of Lunch already. So uh, another opportunity for engagement is, is to... Uh, is to is to invite people who are less involved in worship to participate missionally uh, in in um, in the activities of the church in the community. So, when when if, if when we train our leaders who are organizing mission opportunities like going to the uh, food pantry, uh, spending the night at the night shelter, helping helping uh, volunteer at a local school, doing cleanup days for uh, for families in need. Uh, uh, doing building construction or repair renovation for families in need. When we're doing that kind of missional engagement in the community, to intentionally invite people who are less involved in worship to, to participate. And that means that we have to make personal invitations because they're not in worship to hear the invitations that are broadcast in the worship service. So when you're creating this list of people who are less involved, make sure that they are prominently displayed on the lists of people that that the that the missional leaders are using to invite people to participate this can be so transformative uh, in in terms of people's connection with Christ remember these are people who at one point made a commitment to Christ that they were willing to pour their whole life to, into they they stood up before a congregation and pledged to support the church through their prayers presence gifts service and witness and, and they have drifted away and are no longer engaging that pledge that they made. But that same spirit that is in you is still resident in them. It is just suppressed. So whenever we engage people in these missional activities, it can kindle the spirit of God that is within them and re-engage them in, in, the, in the life of, of the church. So use the draw of discipleship uh, to... Uh, to engage them through a missional activity that reminds them of the commitment that they once made to Christ and connects them with people in need in the community. Um, let me see if I've got time. I don't have time for a, for an example of this, but there's I have a great example that I'd love to share. You know, remember we're talking about changing behaviors, and so it it is it is not an easy thing to do. And if you want to know about you know, this is great uh, information switch about changing behaviors. So uh, it, it's available in the resource center. Uh, you can check it out, and um, and there's also a lot of stuff online that uh, Chip and Dan Heath have done, uh, videos and others that you can find through Google. Now, uh, one of the realities is is that we are feedback uh, engines. All human beings are. Everybody everybody needs prompt, personal, encouraging feedback in order to change behaviors. And so, uh, whenever you are creating your plan for how to respond to people who are less involved and to engage them more deeply. One of the things that needs to be included in that plan are, are, are ways that you respond to changes in their behavior. So if you have people on your list who, who, you, are, who, who you have specific, uh, I, you've specifically identified this is a person we want to help become more actively engaged in discipleship, a lay person has taken responsibility and knows it is their responsibility to kind of walk with that person closer to Christ and then you see a change in behavior. They come to worship more often. They get involved in a prayer group. They become engaged in a missional activity. That we that we have a plan in place to respond to that with feedback and to say, hey, you know, I noticed that you were there. Uh, that just is so important. And this can be a part of a bigger plan to thank everybody who does uh, some kind of act of missional service. But but the prompt, personal, encouraging feedback is hugely important. Without that. Uh, people are very likely not to continue the behavior, but feedback uh, it can can be hugely Im important. Uh, the The last thing I want to talk to talk about is that we have an opportunity and a lever to uh, to engage people at the point of their aspirations. People have aspirations that uh, some are very positive aspirations, and some are 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 aspirations to avoid something negative. So we want to respond to, to the aspirations that people have and link those aspirations to the gospel of Christ and to participation in life and ministry of the church. 
So, you know, one of the aspirations that people have is to uh, is to escape the fear that is out there right now because there this that we are just immersed in fear. And and that fear has such a, a profoundly negative impact on people's lives. So so to counter to counter uh, the fear that people are experiencing, it's it's important for us to to uh, uh, to uh, in this in this plan of engagement to make sure that we bring them into places where they can experience not fear but forgiveness, where they can see in the context of the shadows and the darkness of this world uh, the imprint of Christ's heart and love. We want to make sure that we are that we are giving them a uh, response to the negativity that's out there that is positive, wholesome, loving, faithful, graceful. So, so as you're thinking about the invitations that you're going to be making, make sure it's to things that build up and encourage and, and provide hope. Responding to a negative aspiration, a, a desire to escape fear with forgiveness, grace, hope, and love. Uh, people are worried. Uh, they're they're overwhelmed. Uh, the, the the amount of information that people are exposed to is just enormous. They're having a hard time keeping up. Uh, the, there's a great deal of anxiety that just it just oozes around uh, around life. Uh, and and the church has a great opportunity uh, to teach people balance. And 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 so one of the things that you can do that this that helps you connect with people who are less active in your church, but also with people outside the community, is to offer uh, uh, things like Financial Peace University, uh, 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 Richard Swanson's book Margins, uh, t teaching opportunities about how to restore balance and wholeness to life, and that these kinds of opportunities offered uh, Sunday mornings, Saturday afternoons. Uh, any time during the week, especially around a meal, uh, have have great appeal to people, and and might be a good way to bring somebody back into a deeper and more engaged uh, experience of life in the church. Now, I remind you, discipleship is a contact sport. Uh, we 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 can't just do it inside the building. We have to get out into the community and connect with people. So don't be afraid to hold events uh, at at public spots in your community. Uh, the 4-H club. The uh, the YMCA, a bookstore. They love to have people come into the bookstore and offer a buy, a book study uh, in their in their in their store, especially something that they can where they, when they can sell a book. To have a to have a group that meets in a uh, cafe or even a bar is is a great opportunity to to uh, connect with people that otherwise wouldn't be able to connect with the church. Um, I, I've already talked about hunger, so uh, I'll I'll stop there now. You know, I've got about uh, 12 minutes left, and so I'm going to respond to questions that you have, and I'm also going to give you a link here that uh, it'll show up in the chat room. That is a link to um, it's a it's a link to the document that uh, that will have all of these resources on it. It'll have a, a, a uh, it has the uh, sample of the uh, attendance page, the connection cards, links to the books uh, that uh, were resources for me in developing this uh, this webinar. It also has um, um, links to two other opportunities: the turnaround boot camp and the um, uh, uh, the turnaround boot camp and and the uh, uh, from first-time guests to fully engaged disciples webinar that I did in the fall, that uh, is a similar kind of webinar to this, and it it it, it was recorded. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, and it will be up on the on the web tomorrow sometime, uh, along with all of the resources. So if you have questions, if you just put them in the chat room, I'll be happy to respond to them. Uh, if you're still with me. <clears throat> Okay, the link the link actually is a live link. You can click on it. Uh, you can also highlight it and um, uh, highlight it and and copy it. Oh, Marilyn, thank you. A Bible study at Bojangles and at a local breakfast restaurant. That's that's wonderful. That's great. Uh, 
Uh, I will say, uh, some, somebody asked us, um, okay, how can a church that's been around 100 years create a new reputation for actually wanting guests to attend? Um, yeah, you're you're talking about several several issues there. Uh, w one issue is is that uh, congregations that have been around for a while have become set in their relationships with each other, and and so people are less open to relationships with new people, uh, and especially whenever we're talking about large numbers of new people. So congregations will often uh, just kind of bristle at the idea of some of the people that live actually in the community around their congregation. Uh, coming to their church because those people are different from them. Uh, you remember the picture of the uh, congregation uh, that that uh, where the people were all dressed similarly. Uh, that kind of tribal uh, homogenous uh, mentality uh, permeates our churches. We we have calibrated ourselves to each other so thoroughly that when somebody comes in who's somewhat different from us. It's not only that we uh, are unwelcoming to them, but they don't feel welcomed because they can see immediately the distance, the cultural distance between them and the others. So one of the things that can happen that's very helpful to a church is to do some training in cultural sensitivity, uh, uh, to, to invite someone from the community that you're trying to reach to actually come and, and uh, tell their story. Uh, I, I'll give you an example. I was in a... Um, I was in a um, an airplane the other day, and a, a young man sat down next to me. And his in his left arm, uh, he was sitting on my right, and his left arm was covered from shoulder to to uh, to fingernails uh, with uh, an elaborate tattoo. Now, I don't have a tattoo, and tattoos kind of freak me out. Uh, I, I I'm I'm yeah you know, I'm 56 years old. I don't I don't know what it is, but they they kind of freak me out. And so I've really never, ever in 56 years asked anyone about their tattoo. But, you know, I have this, I have this conviction that I, I should talk to people. You know, I'm very introverted, uh, but, but I have this conviction that, you know, as a loving person, as a person of Christ, I should talk to people. So, so I just asked this young man. It took, me, it took me about 10 minutes to get the courage to ask him. But finally I asked him, I said, so that tattoo that you have on your arm, I said, that's really something. I said, did you get that all at once? I mean, did they? How long does it take to put that kind of elaborate, you know, decoration on your arm? He said, oh no. He said it took me, it took me five trips to uh, to get the tattoo. I said, wow, that's amazing. So, so did you have this whole design in mind whenever you had the first one done, and then you've just kind of, you know, finished it over time? Or he said, no. He said, he said I did the first one, and it was complete. And he said, then about a year later, I did another one. I said, so this is kind of like telling your story in your on your arm. He said, yeah, it is. It's kind of like every one of these things has, has to do with something that was going on in my life at that time. So I learned something absolutely amazing about what a tattoo meant for that young man. So, so you, you wouldn't want to do this probably in front of the whole congregation, but to do this in, in your leadership group, to, uh, in charge conference or in, a, or in an administrative council meeting, or if the administrative council is kind of uh, curmudgeonly, then, uh, then pick a group of people that you think might be open to others and invite someone from the community to come in and just to explain their story. Tell about, about their clothing, about where they live, about their attitudes, about about what they aspire to in life. And, and, and you'll discover that in, in cultivating that cross-cultural sensitivity, you open the doors to some other, um, yeah, so just, uh, uh, yeah, so, so just you'll open the door to, to deeper relationships with them and maybe have an opportunity for the, uh, 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 for the congregation to begin to become a congregation of, in, of invitation. All right, so, um, Steve, if you just email the document to me <coughs> at S. James, I'll, I'll put it here. So if you just email the document to me, I'll uh, I'll have it uh, uh, up on the website that's associated with this as well. <coughs> Uh, here is another website that you can go to that'll also have. This is also in the in the other link. 
but this this website uh, will is where is the website that will host the uh, webinar recording tomorrow and it also has all of the resources and links to the resources on it as well and again you can copy and paste that all right I'm going to I'm going to uh, close the meeting in prayer I'm going to ask you to stay with me through the prayer and when I close the meeting there'll be a, a survey that will come up on your screen uh, that I just really hope you will take it, it will take you two minutes to finish it and uh, what this will do is give me some feedback about this because you know I'm putting I'm putting this out there and I can see some people typing it says I have 60 participants left uh, on the on the webinar we had as many as 69 at one time so it'll help me know how to calibrate this and do this better in the future so thank you again so much for being a part of this I'm gonna close in prayer and then we'll uh, we'll turn off the uh, meeting and you'll have a chance to do that survey Lord we're so grateful for everyone who participated today and I pray that your spirit would work with their spirit to help them create a plan to respond to people who are who are uh, uh, connected with your church but who are less active in their discipleship Lord, the, we know these are people, children for whom Christ has died, and we pray that you'd give us courage to, to, to uh, set aside the time to do this, and uh, that you would call out from among our congregation leaders who would be willing to do this, that they might be able to uh, deepen the relationships people have with each other and with you. Thank you so much for your leadership, Lord, and for you guiding people uh, to uh, uh, seek to follow you more closely. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, thanks again, everybody. I'll see you soon. So the survey's coming up right now.